Hello, everyone. Welcome back to ICCB 2021. This is session D of uh, Tuesday. Um, before we begin, we have some announcements from our program chair, Kavita Bala. Remember, you can follow along with the live stream on YouTube for our talks and post questions to the authors. So I'll turn it over to our program chair for some announcements. So hi all, thank you all for being here. Now, for those of you who were there at the ungodly hours when we were speaking on Sunday, we actually kicked off on Sunday, of course, but that was in different time zones. And now we are more catering to the East Coast and West Coast time zones. And so given this, that we have actually been trying to operate in different time zones over the three days, we thought we'll recap uh, some of the information that we did share on Sunday about the process that we ran and um, uh, for ICCP this year. So with that, I'll try to quickly share my slides. And this is material we did cover earlier, uh, but I hope you can see, just to give you an idea of the paper review process in ICCP. And the reason we are actually talking about it too, this year is quite unique. You may know that we have also optics that we integrated very explicitly. So we have the usual graphics, computer vision, computational photography people, and now we have optics people. And different that, given that there are very different conventions of how you review papers in each of these communities, we thought it'd be good to just quickly mention what we did for ICCP. So one of the things that you see a lot around reviewing across the board in various communities nowadays is that the quality of reviewing is often not um, high. And we really wanted to make sure we had a very high quality reviewing process. So we handpicked the program committee members to be senior, to have had experience with ICCP and to really be very strong contributors in the community. And you can go and look at our webpage to see who are the program committee members. Uh, we had full length paper submissions, the, the usual double blind submission and review. And each paper got at least four very detailed exp expert reviews. And in fact, there was very spirited discussion um, uh, about each paper between the reviewers. It was a very robust process and we're very happy with how that played out. Um, each of the authors, of course, got to, and all of you who are listening in, know that you'd got to turn in your rebuttals and we allowed you to include new experiments and results. Again, that's not necessarily the norm across the board. And then it was discussed again very extensively by the program committee and by the chairs, and then that resulted in final decisions. Final decisions were accept, reject, and also conditional accept, which is a bit new this year. And even papers that were accepted needed to show, just like a journal review process, they needed to show that the promises they made in their rebuttal were actually things they incorporated in their committee. And I know many of you are authors who are listening in. Thank you. You know, you did a great job of really incorporating the feedback you got. So we believe that it resulted in the best kind of best paper at the end of the process. So all of told, it isn't easy getting a paper into ICCP. And seven of the papers that were selected for acceptance to ICCP were also selected for PAMI. So as is, so they went to PAMI, they're the papers that they submitted to ICCP, but of course, multiple additional revisions and reviews based on the feedback from the reviewers. And these were selected based on their positioning right now as good journal quality papers that were ready to be there for PAMI. And Ko Nishino and Kalyan Sunkavali were the co-editors for that. We are very grateful to them. We also then had a best paper award committee, and let me see, there you go. Uh, it's Sri Nair, Singh Bing Kang, uh, and uh, Rick Zaliski were very kind to then select the best paper awards. You saw the best paper runner up earlier today. And I just wanted to announce again, the best paper award went to designing display pixel layouts for under pan panel cameras. This is Anki Yang and Ashwin Shankanarayanan. And their presentation is actually in the 4.30 session today. For So for all of you listening in, please hang in there till the last session. We're really excited excited uh, to have all these great papers that are coming up for the rest of the day. With that, I'll turn you over to this session back to Serene. I'm looking forward to seeing all the talks. Thank you all for joining us. Great. Thank you, Kavita, for that uh, explanation of the program review. Uh, for this session, we have six papers, uh, that uh, four papers and two abstracts uh, to be presented. And I'm going to uh, Again, remind you that you can you can ask questions via the live chat on the YouTube stream during the talk, and at the end of each paper presentation, we will have a Q and A section session. So, with that, I'll introduce the first paper: Event GAN leveraging large scale image data sets for event cameras. The authors are Alex Jihao Zhu, Ji Yun Wang, Kong Kant, and Kostas Danilidis. And let's watch the video. Hi, everyone. Today, I will be presenting a work titled EventGAN, Liberating Large-Scale Image Datasets for Event Cameras. My name is Alex Zhu, and this is 
joint work with Zian Wang, Tang Kant, and Kostas Danilidis, all work is performed at the University of Pennsylvania. So as an intro, um, I'm going to describe a little bit about what event cameras are. So these are similar to conventional cameras in that they take light in through a lens, which hits a pixel array. And the difference here is how the light is processed by the pixels themselves. Instead of integrating light over fixed periods of time, event cameras detect changes in log light intensity. So whenever the log intensity over a given pixel changes over a given threshold, here we denote as theta, the camera will emit an event at that pixel instantaneously. This event will contain the XY position of the change, a timestamp that's accurate down to microseconds, and a polarity that indicates whether the change was positive or negative. So instead of seeing frames at fixed intervals over time, event cameras will basically generate a point cloud over X, Y, and T. Uh, you can visualize some of these events here at the bottom of a fidget spinner spinning relatively quickly, where the grayscale in the back is the conventional frame-based camera, which suffers from significant motion blur, while the events uh, on the left projected into X, Y uh, do not have this problem if you look at the right. Uh, this is projected along Y and T, and you can see that we can reconstruct the entire trajectory of the fidget spinner with very high temporal resolution. These cameras come with a number of benefits over conventional cameras. Uh, as you saw before, they have very, very low latency because they do not have fixed exposure times and instead track changes as they occur. This allows us to track very fast motions without uh, traditional issues such as motion blur. Another benefit of these cameras is that they have very, very high dynamic range, once again due to the uh, loss of the exposure time. This gives them very excellent performance in both low light conditions as well as challenging lighting conditions where you have high variations in light intensity. Finally, uh, these cameras have relatively low power consumption compared to conventional cameras. While event cameras show a lot of promise over conventional cameras in a number of different dimensions, there is one current problem in trying to address conventional computer vision problems with event cameras. That issue stems from the fact that most of modern computer vision is dominated by deep learning. These methods have shown immense success in a number of different problems, but they have been shown to be extremely data hungry and require very large data sets before they are able to perform at a high level. While we have had many years to collect large data sets for conventional cameras, we currently do not have such data sets for events simply due to the novelty of the sensor. In this work, we would like to take advantage of the fact that many event cameras produce both events and frames, and we propose a new neural network architecture that can take current images and generate synthesized events so that we can leverage the labels that have already been generated for these images to train event-based neural networks. The problem of simulating events from images is not a new one. However, all of the previous related work has focused on handcrafted methods where experts who are very familiar with both cameras will explicitly model their equations that govern the relationship that transforms images to events themselves. However, these methods require very, very careful fine tuning uh, for every single camera that you would like to use. And in addition, different event cameras have different operating regimes. And so switching to a different camera might require a completely new algorithm that requires additional expert intervention. In addition, the noise distribution of events is also relatively difficult to model. And so getting this precise is still an open problem. In this work, we would like to take advantage of the fact that we have paired events and images which are registered to the same image plane. And so we would like to use a deep neural network that can learn directly this transformation from data without any kind of hyperparameter tuning from the user. Another additional problem in the event modeling problem is that the actual problem going from a pair of images to events that occur between these images is ill-posed. What I mean is that between any two pair of images, say the two blue lines that you see on the slide, there are a near infinite number of possible events that can be generated from the same scene. If we look at this blue dot that moves between these two uh, points in time from the top of this image to the bottom, the images themselves are relatively fixed. The blue dot simply moves from the top to the bottom. However, because of the event's extremely high temporal resolution, one possibility is that this dot just took a linear trajectory from the start to the end. And so generated these three events that you see in orange. However, an equally possible outcome is that the blue dot first went up and then down and then up again and generated this green set of events that you see here. Both of these trajectories are technically equally probable. And in fact, there are an infinite number of such trajectories depending on the motion in between the two frames. If, say, we had a neural network that was directly supervised to just generate events using something like an L1 or L2 loss, we would be locking ourselves into a single one of these trajectories depending on what was seen in the data distribution. Instead, we would like to actually learn a probability distribution over these trajectories such that we're able to generate a flexible uh, set of events from any given pair of images. What is the appropriate loss function that we should apply on the output of this network? 
One possibility is to apply a direct L1 loss, where we simply supervise the network to try to, as accurately as possible, reconstruct the events that were observed for the pair of images. However, as noted before, this problem is very ill-posed, and applying such a direct loss would lock us into whatever trajectory was seen at the time of data collection. Instead, in this work, we propose to use an adversarial loss similar to a generative adversarial network, where the discriminator actually learns the probability over trajectories. However, we observed during training that simply using a DAN is very unstable and typically will not generate outputs that are satisfactory. As a result, we propose a pair of additional side losses, which act as additional discriminators that apply additional constraints to the outputs of this network. The first such discriminator is one that is essentially a pre-trained image reconstruction network. This network will take in a set of events and a previous frame and output the next frame in the sequence. This network was pre-trained on real data. And so at training time for the event simulator, we apply a loss such that the reconstructed images from this network, given the simulated events, is as close to the real image as possible. What this means is that our simulated events must encode all the information needed to reconstruct the next frame, given the previous frame and the simulated events alone. As you can see, compared to the previous GAN output, applying a reconstruction loss allows us to more faithfully reconstruct the accurate number of events for each pixel in the scene. And already we can see that the output of the network is much closer to the true distribution. However, in addition to just encoding the information needed to reconstruct the next image, the output of our network must also respect the motion characteristics of the events. In particular, events at points in the scene should not be allowed to teleport or jump multiple pixels and must represent a smooth transformation uh, across the frame. You can see this in the set of real events as a smooth gradient that occurs from one side of a boundary to the other. In order to enforce this constraint, we apply a second discriminator, which is a pre-trained events to optical flow network. This network is trained to predict the motion between two frames or two points in time, given a set of events that occurred between those points in time. We apply a loss uh, to this output optical flow, which tries to reconstruct once again the next image by warping the previous image using the predicted optical flow. What this means, once we back from this through the network, is that our output events now must encode the correct optical flow information or motion information in the scene. With all of these losses combined, our network can correctly encode the information needed to not only reconstruct the intensity of the image at the next frame, but also can contain accurate motion information that is plausible uh, to have occurred between the two frames. In this image, we show some qualitative results uh, of our method where we train on the MVSEC data set as well as a new data set that we get collected and will release, and where we run inference on the K data set given two temporal frames. We compare our method against the eSIM method, uh, which actually requires known motion parameters. Since these are not available for Kitty, we simply take the first image and apply a random homography. As you can see, because our method implicitly computes some kind of motion between the two frames, we're able to accurately reconstruct the actual motion that, include, that occurred in the frames. In order to evaluate our method quantitatively, we mostly rely on a set of downstream tasks. This is because of the ill-posed problem that I mentioned before, where given a pair of frames, there are actually an infinite number of events trajectories that could satisfy uh, the events that plausibly could have been generated in between these frames. Therefore, if we apply something like a direct L1 loss, uh, we do not actually want to measure exactly whether we patch the observed data directly, but rather whether our generated events are simply plausible for the given pair of frames. In order to do this, um, we use our event GAN network to generate simulated events on the MPI human pose database. This allows us to train a network that takes as input these simulated events and predict 2D human pose. We then fine tune this pre trained network on the DHP19 event data set, which contains both events and ground truth to the human pose. We compare our method uh, against a similar thing trained using ESIM. We also compare against a network that directly saw real training data from events and real 2D ground truth, all trained on DHP19. Here we compare all three methods uh, across different number of training periods, where we see that uh, our method is able to outperform both other methods across a number of different training schemes. One thing I want to highlight here is that actually all three methods converge very, very quickly, almost in a single epoch. This is likely because the data set is still relatively small, and so it's very easy for a network to uh, basically overfit to this problem very, very quickly. Here we have another qualitative example of the output of our method, where we run our human pose network on real data. Uh, this is data that has never been seen at training time, which we recorded after training. As you can see, uh, we're able to very accurately reconstruct the 2D pose of this human, even in relatively challenging environments, fast motions, and a number of different poses. 
Another downstream method that we use to evaluate our method is that of object prediction. In this evaluation, we use a YOLO-V3 network, which was trained to take as input simulated events from the Kitty dataset to predict value boxes for cars. We then fine-tuned on a subset of the VSET dataset, which once again we labeled manually uh, with value boxes around vehicles. We evaluated the method and compared against a method that was similarly trained, uh, but except taking frames of input, and so not requiring any kind of simulation. We also compare against ESIM, which was uh, simulated in a similar way. From the quantitative evaluation here, we can see that our method compares relatively favorably, uh, very similar to the frame-based method, which requires no simulations, and actually outperforms in harder cases uh, where vehicles are small or occluded. In addition, ESIM almost completely fails in this case, largely likely because it cannot accurately uh, reproduce motions in the scene. Finally, we also provide a direct quantitative comparison against the more recent work named VID2E, which is also built on the ESIM framework. While this problem may be a little flawed because of the ill-posed nature of the problem going from images to events, we show that our method is able to more accurately reconstruct the, the events observed at data collection time. One issue with these handcrafted methods is that the contrast threshold must be known at simulation time. This threshold is the one that governs the amount of which the log intensity must change before an event is generated. Here, we show that even with a relatively large sweep over possible contrast thresholds, our method is able to generate more accurate events over any given contrast threshold. This also highlights the problems that one may encounter if one wants to use a handcrafted method for this task. Thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, if you are interested in the method, we have our code and also the data set available on this link, or if you use this QR code on this slide. Okay. Uh... Thanks for the presentation. We will proceed with the Q&A session. Just a reminder that we are monitoring the live chat and please put your questions into the chat and we can ask. Uh, we have Claude Ji Yuang joining us uh, to help answer some questions. So while people put their questions, I guess I'll start off. Uh, Claude, thank you for the interesting work uh, and presentation. Um, I had one question about, um, and this was mentioned a bit in the paper itself about time and mm -hmm. event representation in time. Um, how does your network handle the fact that, you know, the event cameras are very asynchronous? And mm -hmm. so this time representation is some form of accumulated uh, events over time. Can you talk a little bit about your decisions when designing the network to handle that? Yes, uh, so basically events are uh, usually represented as like individual uh, events and uh, in order to be able to uh, use them in uh, deep neural networks, uh, we need some way to convert it into either some image-based uh, representation or uh, some volumetric uh, representation. So in this in this work, uh, we chose to uh, use sort of a, a volumetric uh, representation representation for events. So rather than having individual asynchronous events, we actually bend them into uh, time time slices, and uh, for for each event, we put them into um, uh, if uh, a cell into uh, of of the volume. But instead of uh, putting the raw event in, we also consider um, the the distance in terms of time uh, between this event and uh, the neighboring bins. So that's sort of a trilinear interpolation in the x y t volume. Uh, so in that case we both have the intensity information from the events. Um, that is, we can know how many events are in this bin. And also we kind of preserve the uh, temporal resolution of the events because uh, we, we kind of uh, interpolate based on uh, how far away the, the event is from, uh, from, uh, from the cell temporally. So uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, in our training, we separate the, uh, the positive polarity and negative polarity so that we have 18 uh, channels in total in terms of time. That way we can actually directly feed uh, this volume into our uh, network to uh, do any necessary training or inference. And, and this decision is made prior to any training of the network. Would this be considered like a hyperparameter of the data representation? being? Yes, uh, exactly. So currently in the event community, uh, most of the state of the art uh, uh, methods for uh, let's say flow estimation or disparity estimation, they're all based on 
uh, frame-based or volumetric uh, based representations. Uh, in this work, we, we chose this one because it's, uh, it's widely used. And also uh, uh, you're right that this is a hyperparameter that we can tune prior to uh, using this method. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, so maybe I'll ask a second question. Um, you did a lot of experiments showing that models trained on this simulated data performed very well at matching the statistics of data. One other application I could foresee is kind of data set augmentation, where mm -hmm. you might have limited real data and then uh, you augment it with the event game. Could you talk maybe or speculate a bit about how your method could be useful in those cases? Exactly. So. Um... Currently, uh, one problem that uh, lies in the, the event vision is that uh, we don't have enough data, uh, which is the main motivation of our work. That is, we want to augment the existing uh, image-based uh, data sets into event data, set, event data sets. So previously, uh, the way people do this is by uh, having uh, the, the event, uh, the, the having the simulator run in the simulated environment, uh, in the synthetic environment, so that we have the ground truth uh, pose and uh, 3D environment uh, so, so that we can uh, generate infinite number of events. But the problem with that is that uh, it's not based on realistic images and that uh, we want to be able to generate arbitrary uh, events from uh, real image data sets. And uh, in our training, uh, we, we can actually uh, take advantage of this uh, by generating events from real images. And uh, when we train an event network, we can use these events uh, from the real images as the training data, uh, plus the real events that will be used for, uh, let's say, uh, for a certain application as fine tuning. So that way we can uh, take advantage of both worlds. We have uh, both events uh, generated from our network and the real events. Uh, so that hopefully will have, uh, uh, will give us better uh, performance as well as a more realistic set of events to train up. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're going to proceed to the next paper. So thank you again for your time. Uh, you, the sir. next paper in the session is the title is Jointly Estimate of Object and Pupil Drones Matrix Using an LED Array. The authors are Jiang Dai, Pavan Kanda, Shi Chi Zhu, and Rourke Horstemeyer. Let's start the video. Hi everyone, my name is Xiang Dai. Uh, today I'm going to talk about polarization and phase imaging using an LED array microscope. So let's start from the motivation. So this is an image of rabbit spinal cord core section at 2x magnification microscope. We can see it has a really large field of view. However, if we zoom in for some specific region here, we can see the resolution is relatively low. If we want to have a higher resolution like this, so we, we can simply uh, swap the lens, uh, swap the objective into 40X. Then we are sacrificing the field of view to get a higher uh, resolution images. So is there any method that can help us to get a very large field of view and also with high resolution images? And uh, this is our first motivation. And the second motivation is that for general microscope, we can get absorptions and phase at the same time. However, if we want more information like polarization properties, uh, we want a diatomation, birefringence, and uh, like orientation and so on, how can we get all of them at the same time? So our second motivation is that how to get uh, multiple imaging modalities. This reminds us a new technique called Fourier tachography. So I'm going to quickly introduce Fourier tachography first. So here, uh, here is a general microscope. Simply swap the uh, light source as a, a LED array. So the, if we have a light illuminate the sample and the image system captured only the part of the diffracted light, then in the image space, we can see the uh, low resolution images like this. And then in the frequency space, we can see the light, uh, this part of the light is only part of the frequency space. And the size of the frequency space is decided by the system numerical aperture. 
in uh, in another word, this is this part of the information is real or what we expected to see. Then, if we tilted the illumination, then the imaging system are, uh, is capturing another part of the light. Then, in the frequency space, we can see the pupil. This pupil is shifted towards some to, uh, some direction, which is decided by the LED position. Therefore, if we have enough different, different illumination angles, which can cover the whole frequency space of the sample, which means we are getting the whole, if the, all the information of this specific sample. Then we are using phase retrieval algorithms can help us to get a very high uh, resolution images based on this group of data. So this is the main idea of Fourier tachography. So uh, in a Fourier tachography, we are using a scalar version of model. And if we want to talk about polarization results, we need to uh, extend it into vectorial description. So we are using John's calculus here. Let's start from the Fourier tachography model first. So the light is described as an exponential function. And then we have a sample and the pupil aberration of the imaging system. After the light illuminated sample, then we do the Fourier transform to, uh, to change the image plane into the frequency plane. And the different illumination angle will cause a constant phase at the light. In, uh, in the meantime, the frequency space will represent a, a spatial shift towards some direction, which is decided by the LED position. Then the, the system, uh, system aberration will apply to the sample. Afterwards, we take inverse Fourier transform to arrive image plane back. Then we got the intensity values captured by CCD. So this is the uh, forward model of the Fourier tachography. Then uh, how do we do the uh, vectorial Fourier tachography? And we need to plug in like polarized, two polarizers. The first one as a generator, which help us to generate polarized light after the, after the uh, generator. Then another polarizer named analyzer, which is help us to analyze what's a uh, polarization status then. So uh, we need to describe the light and sample in John's calculus. And in John's calculus, the light after the generator, which is fully polarized light can be described as a two by one vector, which also it is the complex va values. Then we have a sample matrix, which is a two by two complex matrix. Afterwards, we do a similar thing. We do the inverse Fourier transform and the different illumination angles can be described as a free, uh, uh, free, like spatial shift in frequency space. Then we have a pupil, which is the image system aberration. It is also a two by two complex values matrix. Then by applying the, by multiplying these aberrations, then we finally, we get the inverse Fourier transform back to the uh, image plane. But this is the, uh, this is the, uh, like two by two, uh, two by one vectors. Then we uh, multiply with the analyzer that we showed here. Then we got the field fun uh, field uh, vectors. Uh, finally, we are arriving at the CCD plane, which are uh, where we get the uh, intensity, which is measurement. So this is the extension of the general Fourier tachography model into a vectorial Fourier tachography model. How do we uh? How do we choose our measurements? Because we have a different combinations. So we extended the forward model into its full, full version. We can see the equation is super long and we still need to do encoding submission here. Then we need to carefully choose our measurement strategy. For example, if we choose zero degree linear polarizer as the analyzer, therefore we only have AXX equal to one and other parts are equal to zero. Then we can simply cancel out all these parts. Then we only left this part of the equation. Then if we choose a uh, zero degree linear polarizer as, uh, as the generator, then we can set AX equal to one and AY equal to zero. Then finally the equation will be super uh, simple and we can easily do incoherent submission here. Then uh, if we want to solve uh, two by two complex matrix. We need at least the four equations. Therefore, we choose four different combinations of a generator and analyzer, which can provide us four different equations. And also uh, we had a zero in the vector, which can help us to do, uh, to do the encoding submission, make it more clear. So that's why we are choosing four equations to solve for the sample and the pupil, which is the uh, imaging operations here. So how do we solve that? 
we start from the uh, solution. We are uh, we start from the uh, raw data, like the center illumination. Then we have we set the center illumination as the amplitude, which is just the initialization, and set the, their phase equal to zero. Yeah, their frequency space will look like that. Afterwards, we took part of the frequency space, which is the size is decided by the system numerical aperture. The position is decided by the uh, LED position. Then we uh, select. Then we do we generate the measurements based on the Jones, uh, based on our forward model. Then we can calculate our um, the intensity that we are uh, we are getting from the uh, from the CCD and. Uh, then we replace the amplitude by our measurements. We update the imaging estimates with our measurements. Then we are providing some real data into our estimation. Afterwards, we regenerate the uh, frequency space of the, of the Jones matrix. Then we have an updated position of the frequency space. By replacing this, the, specific, uh, the same region of the original uh, frequency space, we got an updated frequency space. So this is one loop of single LED, like center LED. If we can go through all the LEDs, the, the updating will cover the whole frequency space, which means that we can update the whole frequency space. Then finally, we can calculate the, the amplitude and phase at the same time. Then we are getting the Jones matrix now. And afterwards, we can calculate the polarization properties later. And these results are our like simulation results. So I'll directly jump into our uh, experiment setup and results. So just to re remind uh, everyone that this is our setup result. And uh, under different measurement strategies, as we choose from the measurement strategy slide, then we have a group of data under different LED illuminations. Then our light is red light and we are using 15 by 15 LED array and all this information are here. Based on this setup, we are getting a synthetic NA is 0.4 and original system aperture is 0 0.1. So we can have almost like five times, five times uh, resolution improvement. Here are the, some experimental results. We can see here are the raw images. The resolution has been significantly improved and the uh, reconstructed polarization properties are shown below. In the meantime, we also reconstruct the uh, polarization pupil reconstruction. And uh, uh, these results are matching the result that we got from the uh, general 2D Fourier tachography. And we are also providing the, uh, the polarization status. And, uh, uh, the validation experiment are also uh, being done and uh, uh, we have all of these results uh, in, at the, uh, in the other slides. And then in conclusion that I showed in this talk, we are talking about the full factorial foreign psychography model. And then we also provide a unique measurement strategy. Finally, we provide a solver for vectorial Fourier tachography. And thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your uh, listening. And if you have any extra qu questions that I didn't answer at that time, please feel free to email me. Great, thank you for the presentation. Uh, now we'll start the Q&A session. Uh, I have author Zhang Dai with us here to answer your questions. Reminder again that you can write on the live chat to the right of the video screen in YouTube, and I'll be monitoring that and relaying those questions to the author. So while uh, uh, you all think of your questions to write, maybe I'll start out with some questions. So um, the very interesting presentation, very interesting work. I'm very interested in the optimization uh, and the it seems like this method uses a lot of inverse in from the frequency domain to the spatial domain. And one of the common things that people worry about is noise and how does noise be affected? Do you, do you have any comments on, have you studied the noise properties of your system and how it affects the uh, estimation of the Jones matrix? Okay. Um... For the noise side, uh, we try to input some Gaussian noise in the reconstruction. It can, uh, like, it can deal with it uh, finely. But and also the noise part that you mentioned, we can uh, some part of the noise 
can be re, uh, recognized as uh, like optical system like error or aberrations. So it can be included in the pupil uh, reconstruction. So that means some part of the noise can be solved uh, in the pupil reconstruction of the imaging system. And some part of noise such as like Gaussian noise can be dealt with. But if we put some strong uh, Poisson noise, sometimes it will not work as good as it is. Okay. Um, so we have some actual talks from the audience. So Nick and Tipa, I uh, wanted to ask if you wanted to push this to a high synthetic numer numerical aperture NA, wh what would you need to do to modify your approach, if at all? Um, high synthetic NA, I think uh, the, the change will be some part of the setup. And I think the code should be uh, pretty direct, just the changing some parameters we can do with that. And just a reminder for the audience, what was the NA of your system? Oh, our system uh, numerical aperture is uh, a 0.1. It's a really low cost setup, and uh, we are trying to validate that it is, can be deal with different, like very low cost uh, building microscope. Okay. Um, the next question from Akshat Dave. Um, nice talk. How are the polarization changes due to the pupil and the optics modeled or calibrated in your approach? Okay. Um, so um, it's, it actually, it doesn't matter how you uh, calibrate that. It, it matters that the relative position of the generator and analyzer and uh, uh, between the polarizer combinations, we are using imaging registration because we want the, uh, the almost the same position. We have uh, like very similar things. So we can use imaging registration between different combinations of the polarizers. And for the single, like for, for example, like zero degree and zero degrees, we can just uh, relatively uh, cal calibrate that. Okay, and um, seeing if there's any other questions, if not, I'll ask one last question, which is I, I, central to the approach seems to be the linear polarizers for the generator and analyzer uh, gratings. Um, has there been any thoughts about uh, what if you went to circular polarizing polarizers or something like that? Yeah, one of uh, my uh, previous groups, uh, PhD student is working on that. Uh, uh, he's trying to modify this uh, setup to do a single like single shot with circular polarizer and uh, uh, combined with Fourier tachograph. Do you know like what 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 is the changes that would happen if you went from your linear polarizers in the system to circular? Uh, they are basically the same, but the changing will be in the forward model. So it will be more complicated. And when you are solving that, it's not uh, simple. Like in, uh, in my solver, it's simple. It's a, like uh, a linear combination and you are solving equations. But in the circular polarizer, it will be more uh, difficult. You are playing with some uh, phase, phase changing in that inside in between. So we want to start with linear polarizer, which like a dummy model. Then we are extending into like higher levels and different, more difficult like combinations of the uh, linear uh, polarizers. Great, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for this Q&A. So we're gonna continue on to the third paper in the session. Uh, this paper uh, is entitled SASI, Super Pixelated Adaptive Spatiospectral Imaging. Uh, the authors are Vishwanath Saraganam, Michael Dizu, Richard Berenik, Ashok Viragavan, and Ashwin Shankarnarayan and we'll continue with watching the video. Hello everyone, my name is Vishwanath and this talk is on SASE, Super Pixelated Adaptive Spatial Spectral Imaging. This work focuses on building high spatial, spectral and temporal resolution hyperspectral cameras by relying on adaptive sampling mechanism. Our approach can capture highly complex objects such as microscopic images, with as few as one RGB image and a sparse set of spectral measurements. To understand the importance of such a system, let us dive into how hyperspectral images are scanned. Broadly, there are two classes of scanning hyperspectral images. The first one involves microsampling, where each spatiospectral voxel is scanned individually. The second class is compressive sensing, where the measurements are multiplexed to reduce the overall number of measurements. Let's then dive into NICO sampling and understand it further. One simple approach for scanning the hyperspectral image involves a tunable spectral filter that can capture images at several narrowband wavelengths. 
the full hyperspectral image is then captured by simply going from one end of the spectrum to another end. An alternate approach called push broom camera instead relies on the dispersive power of prism. Push broom camera consists of a slit that selects a single row of the scene's image. The spectrum of the single row is then dispersed using a prism, allowing us to capture the full spectrum of all pixels in that row. By sweeping from top to bottom, one can capture the full hyperspectral image of the scene. Nyquist samplers are simple setups but suffer from two major drawbacks. As each sensor pixel measures a single spatial spectral bin, the overall light levels are reduced. This, along with the mechanics of the camera, imply long acquisition times, preventing real-time data capture. The second class of imagers rely on compressive sensing, where the setup captures far fewer measurements than the signal dimension. An ubiquitous setup in hyperspectral imaging is the coded aperture snapshot spectral imager, or CASI. CASI replaces the slit in push broom camera with a random and dense mask. The sensor now measures spatially and spectrally multiplexed images of the scene. The key idea here is that the measurements are densely multiplexed. The hyperspectral image can then be recovered by solving a linear inverse problem using one of the many existing techniques. The issue with this approach is that the inverse problem is inherently ill-conditioned. We will see later that this leads to loss in accuracy or oftentimes reliance on very specific priors to solve the problem. So how do we sample and reconstruct hyperspectral images efficiently? The spectral content of a scene is often very complex, but we do observe one thing. There are small spatial regions where color is approximately the same. It then makes intuitive sense that spectrum will likely be the same as well. Such spatially homogeneous regions are called superpixels and adhere to object and texture boundaries and provide a low dimensional representation in the local neighborhood. How do we exploit this idea so that spectrum is the same over a small region? It should then suffice to sample at least one location within each superpixel to effectively measure the spectral content of the scene. The spectrum at other locations will simply be a scaled version of this measured spectrum within the superpixel. We exploit this structure to build an adaptive imager that requires only a sparse set of spectral measurements along with one RGB image. Indeed, we can achieve a very high resolution hyperspectral image with as few as two images. Our core contribution is in the form of an imaging setup that adaptively measures spectrum adapted to the scene's properties. Our optical setup consists of two optical paths. The first path includes an RGB camera that captures the color image of the scene. The second path includes a spatial spectral sampler with a programmable spatial mask that turns every spatial pixel into a horizontal streak of spectrum. The measurement pipeline proceeds as follows. First, the RGB or the guide camera captures a color image of the scene, which is used to build superpixels. These superpixels are then utilized to generate a mask that is then loaded onto the modulator. The grayscale sensor then captures a spatiospectral image of the scene's hyperspectral image modulated by the mask, giving rise to a sparse set of non-overlapping spectra. The spectra are then fused along with the guide image to compute the full hyperspectral image, giving rise to high spatial resolution from the guide image and high spectral resolution from the spectral measurements. All of this just requires one extra adaptive step, implying that we can achieve video rate measurements without compromising any resolution. But how good are superpixels to identify spectrally homogeneous regions? To answer this, we took an existing hyperspectral image and computed the similarity of spectra within a superpixel to the spectra at its centroid. As can be seen here, most spatial locations have spectra that are extremely similar, which supports our hypothesis. So given this hypothesis, how, how do we then find a sampling mask 
that utilizes the superpixel information. While an optimal sampling mask is extremely hard to estimate, we have a simple strategy that is computationally very inexpensive. Our goal is to sample in such a way that no two spectra overlap and we have as many sampling locations as possible. To achieve this, we first start with a mask obtained by opening centroids of each superpixel. This may, however, not ensure that openings are sufficiently apart. We then follow a set of heuristics. We first ensure minimum separation by moving or removing sample locations such that they are separated by the number of spectral bands along each row. This operation takes no more than a millisecond per image. Then we re-estimate the superpixels with the new sampling locations, which guarantees that each superpixel has at least one open. Finally, we add more sampling locations while continuing to satisfy the non-overlapping criteria, which ensures that we have maximum light throughput. All these steps, including superpixel formation, take less than 10 milliseconds on a CPU, which lends very well to real-time measurements. The next question is reconstruction. Since we identified that spectra are very similar to each other in a superpixel, we follow a simple rank one reconstruction. Given the guide image and spatial spectral image, we express the neighboring spectra within a superpixel as a scaled version of the spectra at the sample location within the superpixel. The scaling value is given by the guide image. This can be viewed as a rank one reconstruction within a superpixel, which is very fast and takes no more than a second to output 50 bands of a megapixel hyperspectral image on a CPU. The reliance on superpixels motivates our approach, SASE, standing for Superpixelated Adaptive Spatiospectral Imager. SASE is not only faster, but achieves higher reconstruction accuracy than most competing techniques, including approaches that use an extra guide image. Owing to our rank one reconstruction technique, SASE can recover spatial textures very accurately, as can be observed in recovered RGB image. To reiterate, SASE is an adaptive imaging technique that utilizes an RGB image to capture an image of the scene, then superpixelate to identify spatially homogeneous regions, and then generate a sparse sampling mask. This mask is then loaded into the programmable spatial light modulator which then captures spectra at these sampling locations. We built a lab prototype to test SASE, which included an objective that focused the scene's image onto a guide camera and a liquid crystal spatial light modulator. The image from the SLM was then dispersed by a prism and captured by a grayscale camera. Our setup captured 600 by 900 images with 68 bands in the visible spectrum. While a full scan would have required at least 68 images, SASE required just one RGB image and one adaptively and sparsely sampled spectral profiles. Notice how accurately the spe spatial texture is reconstructed. Since we do not multiplex spectra, SASE can simultaneously recover high spatial resolution and spectral resolution, such as a scene illuminated by complex and peaky illuminants such as a compact fluorescent lamp. Owing to simple adaptation strategy and sampling mechanism, SASE can reconstruct hyperspectral videos at 18 frames per second, making it possible to sample even complex scenes like flickering candles. SASE enables not just temporal sampling, but even angular too. For example, consider this beautiful iridescent butterfly specimen that has color dependent on angle of illumination. Capturing hyperspectral image for each of the 12 illumination angles is challenging with traditional techniques. However, with SASE, we just need one RGB and one spatiospectral image per view, drastically bringing down the number of measurements. The reconstructed images have high spatial resolution as evident from the reconstructed image. This data even allows us to dive deeper into how complex light interactions work, including separating the blue iridescent part of the wings, as well as the dull brown underlying structure, even showing the eyes in the wings. 
All of this is possible as we require only a single image per view. In conclusion, we proposed an adaptive hyperspectral imaging setup that starts by capturing an RGB image of the scene. This is then used to adaptively select sampling points. And then spectra is then measured at these sampling points in the form of a single spatial spectral image. This is then fused with a guide image to form a full resolution hyperspectral image at video rate. Thank you. Great, welcome back everyone. Um, we'll start the Q&A session for this paper and I have author Vishwa uh, along with me to answer some questions. Just a reminder, you can write uh, questions in the chat and we'll read them out. Um, and maybe I'll start with actually a question that just popped up from Akshat Dave. Uh, he says, nice talk. If two regions in the image have the same spectrum but different intensities, would they be classified into different superpixels? Could this result in more superpixels than required? That's actually a very good question. And uh, typically the super pixels are generated not on the RGB image, but the LAB uh, image. And this usually takes care of uh, small variations in intensity. Uh, that said, um, more super pixels is not necessarily a bad idea. As long as we satisfy the criteria that any two adjacent uh, openings are such a way that spectrum does not overlap. And this is uh, probably a, a similar type question from Jasper, um, kind of the converse is, are there situations where pixels or patches have similar RGB values, but don't have similar hyperspectral? So maybe the converse of the first Yeah, question. that's actually a very interesting question. And uh, this property is uh, typically called color metamerism, where different spectra map to the same RGB image. Uh, and this uh, 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 usually happens, uh, for example, in microscopy, where uh, uh, different adjacent uh, uh, parts might have the same color the spectrum varies. So under such conditions, I think SASE camera would fail to identify them as two separate objects. However, it is possible to uh, break metamerism by capturing not one image, but a couple of images. Uh, and by studying if the spectrum in uh, what seems to be the same pixel have changed because of uh, two different sampling locations. And if that happens, we know that we can split it further into two separate super pixels. Okay, um, continuing Bargav, as a question, great work. Can this super pixel strategy be adapted for obtaining hyperspectral info for small specular reflection in the scene? So kind of how does it handle specularity? That's a good question. And typically uh, uh, specularities pop up as separate super pixels of their own. So what ends up happening is you isolate uh, and sample them alone in, uh, uh, in such a setting. Okay, um, Vivek, uh, Continuing on, Vivek had a question here that due to both the sparse spatial sampling and dispersion spread by the prism, SNR per pixel on the gray sensor will be low. How does this affect reconstructions of different wavelengths, including the lower wavelengths like blue? So that is a good question. And uh, uh, I think uh, 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 there is uh, uh, two parts to this. The first part is that uh, um, if you consider dense sampling, they typically end up multiplexing spectra from nearby locations. Uh, that might result in higher measurement SNR, but that doesn't necessarily translate to higher reconstruction SNR. And this is primarily because of photon noise. Uh, what our setup does is directly samples the spectrum. And uh, uh, while the measurement enhanced reconstruction SNR seem low, they will still be much better than what would have happened if you had dense sampling. Now in the second part, um, uh, I want to mention that since we are fusing the spectral measurements along with an RGB image as a guide, um, this results in a significant reduction of noise because of the guided filtering approach that we take. Great, thank you. Well, unfortunately we don't have any more time, but these are great questions from the audience and I wanna just encourage the audience to keep asking questions via the live chat. We're gonna continue on. Thank you, Vishra, for the presentation and answering the questions. We're gonna continue on and uh, go to the next paper in the session. Its title is Depth from Defocus as a Special Case of the Transport of Intensity Equation. And the authors are Emma Alexander, Le Leila Kabuli, Oliver Corsart, and Laura Waller. Let's watch the video. 
Hi, this is Emma, and uh, I'll be telling you about a new connection between depth and defocus and the transport of intensity equation. So the depth and defocus problem in photography seeks to recover the depth of a scene from images captured under different focus settings. Uh, similarly, phase retrieval in microscopy determines object phase by comparing intensity captures at different planes. Both of these problems have been considered in a differential setting with uh, depth and differential defocus in photography and the transport of intensity equation or TIE in microscopy. We show that by connecting these two equations, depth from defocus can be seen as a special case of phase retrieval. As a quick review, uh, phase refers to how far along a wave we are, like if we're sitting at a peak or a trough. So if this plane wave illumination encounters a thin refractive object, um, it will be delayed the least where the object is thin, getting a, a head start there. And so the thickness and refractive index of the material are transferred to the phase delay in the outgoing wave. We call this delay the object's phase, and that's what's recovered in phase retrieval. Um, because of its relationship to the thickness of the sample, it can be thought of as an analogous quantity to depth. Uh, but we're going to show that this is not the right way to relate phase and depth if you want to connect phase retrieval and depth from defocus. So to model this relationship properly, we're going to take a step back and start with a look at the qualitative differences between defocus in cameras and in microscopes. Uh, so here's a typical image from a camera shown with this flower in focus. And when the image is defocused by moving the camera away, uh, we can see that the flower is going to get smaller and blurrier and we lose high frequency features like uh, those stripes on the petals. So in contrast, uh, this is a typical image for coherent phase microscopy. So the three cheek cells that are shown here cause very little variation in brightness because they're largely transparent and they're imaged in focus. But I'll show you a, a sweep through the focal stack. And in the defocus regions, both in front of and behind the cells, the images look quite different. Um, so here we are before focus, in focus, after focus, and one more time, out of focus. Uh, so when we talk about defocus in photography and microscopy, both the image content and what happens to it are very different. And we can start to break that down by looking at uh, the kinds of objects that each system typically observes. So in photography, we often assume that the world is made up of Lambertian planes, which are opaque surfaces that reflect light isotropically across angles. Um, in phase microscopy, we observe phase objects, which are largely transparent and deflect the light that is shown through them. Now, we could take this flower picture with a microscope or this cell picture with a camera, but they'd be violating common assumptions in each setting. So, for example, uh, someone from a microscopy background might think of the photographic scene as a dense collection of point sources uh, or an amplitude mask that's illuminated by an incoherent source. Likewise, photographers can think of phase images as photos of glass objects or fluid surfaces. Now, the difference in the effect of defocus comes down to the coherence of the illumination. Photographic scenes are almost always incoherent, and this leads to a loss of high frequencies in the image under defocus. Um, but coherent defocus can actually create new high frequency features in the intensity, not in the field, but in the image intensity. So the difference here is that in the incoherent case, we can think of defocus as a convolution with a low pass filter on the image, uh, but coherent defocus is a convolution that changes the phase of the complex electric field. And so the nonlinearity going from field to intensity means that this process is not linear in the image intensity domain. Okay, so let's break down these differences um, between cameras and microscopes with the caveat that these are generalizations. So you could find exceptions to everything I'll say here, but these are very typical assumptions for the two problems. So for our simple camera, um, consider a single lens imaging system. And for the microscope, we'll assume a 4F system uh, with just ideal thin lenses in each. So right away, we see that the camera has a perspective projection, so the apparent size of an object will change with its depth. Uh, but the microscope is telecentric and this won't happen. Um, we'll also assume that the camera looks at incoherent scenes where there's light propagating in all directions, while the microscope's illumination will be spatially coherent with only one direction. Uh, so that explains the differences we saw in the effects of defocus on both image size and frequency content. Uh, what we haven't done yet is connect that to the depth or the phase of the objects they observe. And we'll do that by taking a defocus change. So there are many ways to defocus an image. Um, but we'll say that there's a specific depth where objects are imaged in focus, and we'll take a step away from that depth to generate the defocus. And in fact, we'll be looking at a differential step in depth. So to understand what happens when we do that, uh, we'll use a mathematical object called the Wigner distribution function. Um, there are a lot of good sources out there that walk through all the details, both from the optics perspective and the computer vision perspective. But to first order, you can think of this as essentially a light field that captures wave optics phenomenon. So for a plane wave uh, passing through an aperture, the light field uh, would have supported a single angle across the width of the aperture. 
Uh, but the WDF would include diffraction at the edges in that vertical spread in red. Um, and it would also contain destructive interference, which is modeled by the negative values shown here in blue. And this object lets us talk about phase in a more general way. So let's say we have a locally linear phase object. That's gonna be a section of a prism. Uh, and when a single plane wave passes through this prism, it will be deflected as we saw before. And so a phase ramp d phi dx corresponds to a deflection in the direction u. And we can reverse that actually to take this as a definition of the phase from the propagation direction. So that works great for coherent illumination. Um, but under partially coherent illumination, multiple plane waves will encounter this object from different directions, and each of them will be deflected independently. So now we don't have a single well-defined phase or direction at each point in space. So this previous relationship doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but we can consider a generalized phase, which is defined again by its spatial derivative as before, um, but now it's going to be related to essentially the average direction of propagation. So this is gonna be a sum of all of the directions U weighted by the radiance-like values of the Wigner distribution function. Okay. So now we have all of our pieces together. Uh, we understand how and why these defocused images are different and we've got some good mathematical tools. So now we can connect them for a direct relationship. Um, and to do that, we'll have them meet in the middle with uh, partially coherent illumination, telecentric optics, uh, and a differential step in defocus. So what happens under this defocus change? Um, we have two answers. They're gonna look a little different at first. So our slightly modified depth and defocus answer is that um, the change in image intensity due to a differential defocus step is gonna be proportional to uh, the scene depth and the image Laplacian. But this is gonna come with some assumptions. So first we take the paraxial approximation, uh, but we'll also require a Gaussian appetizer or aperture code. Um, and additionally, we'll require an object with a well-defined depth like a Lambertian plane or a point source that has some angular isotropy at that depth. Uh, and this is leaning pretty heavily on the assumption of partial coherence, right? So this is going to break down as the scene becomes more coherent. Um, and on the right, we have a, a more general answer from the transport of intensity equation, which says that that image change from the defocus step now with this additional wavelength term um, can be related to derivatives in the image I, uh, that's the intensity, and the phase B. Um, and it turns out uh, that this actually applies to the generalized phase I showed you as well, okay? And all that's needed to derive this is the paraxial approximation. So we can see right away that this is a very general equation on the right, um, and the depth and defocus equation adds assumptions, which makes it a special case. So let's dig into that, right? What are these assumptions doing to reduce TIE to depth from defocus? Uh, so the first assumption was that a defocus point gets imaged as a Gaussian. So paraxially, um, we can approximate a point source as a quadratic phase profile. And then we just require that the image should be a Gaussian. So we can see this uh, matching quadratic term and say that in this instance, where we have a single point source in our WDF, uh, the phase is in proportion to the log brightness. And this is using the classic definition of phase. Now that looks kind of coincidental, uh, but it turns out that this generalizes uh, to these depthy objects, right? Objects with an angular isotropy at some distance z, such as Lambertian surfaces and ensembles of mutually incoherent points. So essentially any WDF that has this structure, right? Where there's a, a locally constant slant in, uh, in the WDF content, uh, and there's this Gaussian weighting across the directions. Um, so if those two conditions hold, uh, the generalized phase defined by the WDF will be linear both in depth and log brightness. Uh, and this condition is going to allow us directly to reduce the general TIE to the special case of depth and defocus. So what does that look like? Uh, we take the TIE on generalized phase, and we plug in our constraint on that phase. And it, it just reduces immediately to the modified depth and defocus equation. It's just plug and chug at this point. And this is exciting because these are both useful equations. Uh, the one on the right gives you phase derivatives that you can integrate to get the object's phase. Uh, and the one on the left says that you can get the depth of an object just by comparing uh, this defocus derivative and the spatial derivative. But that's not the only depth reconstruction method that the theory suggests. Um, another way is to observe that the phase constraint uh, when rearranged, shows us that we can convert a generalized phase measurement into a depth measurement just by dividing out the log brightness and accounting for a calibrated constant. Now, computationally, this is going to be slower and less stable than the direct method, but it demonstrates the deep connection between these quantities. So uh, let's look what, what happens in a toy scenario. I'll take a phase and amplitude object where the phase has these three little bumps and the amplitude has these chirp stripes. Um, and we'll simulate what that looks like, slightly off focus, 
uh, through a Gaussian apodized 4F system under uh, high, medium, and low spatial coherence illumination. So here on the left, I'm representing the angular extent of each illumination source, and it becomes wider as we lose spatial coherence. Now in the high coherence case, the phase of the object shows up as a jagged line in the angular support of the WDF. And uh, the generalized phase in blue matches well with the object's true phase in dotted black. But both death me methods will fail in this case. Uh, we don't recover the true value shown in dotted black, which is a constant out of focus depth. Now in the low coherence case, uh, the illumination fills the aperture. And so the angular support of the WDF is no longer um, informative as to phase. Um, and instead those slanted stripes encode depth um, by the extent of their slant. So in this case, uh, the generalized phase in blue is very different from the object phase in black, uh, but depth can be recovered well. So this matches our expectations. Uh, the phase results are good in the coherent setting and depth results are good in the incoherent setting. Um, where things start to get maybe a little more interesting is the medium coherence setting. So in this case between the extremes, both the zigzag shape indicating object phase and the slanted stripes encoding depth are partially visible. Um, and in this regime, phase and depth are both degraded significantly, um, but very rough estimates can still be recovered. So in partially coherent settings or settings like fluorescent phase microscopy where coherence varies spatially across the image, uh, both methods may have something to offer, particularly for high speed applications where capture and computation time are extremely limited. These differential methods allow very fast measurement of both phase and where applicable depth. So what we've learned is uh, rather than just interpreting phase as an analog to depth, there's this generalized phase quantity that's recovered by the transport of intensity equation. Um, and when the scene content is spatially coherent, this generalized phase is identical to the standard definition of phase. Uh, but when all or part of the image scene is incoherent, we can reinterpret the generalized phase as a depth measurement by correcting for image brightness. Uh, this shows that depth from deep focus in photography can be seen as a special case of phase retrieval methods in, in microscopy. Uh, so thank you for listening and thanks also to my collaborators. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we will do the Q&A uh, session for this paper and I have uh, paper author Emma Alexander joining me. Um, feel free to write your questions uh, in the live chat. I will proceed to read them. While we're waiting for some questions, I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, this was very interesting uh, theoretical work and um, thank you for the nice work and presentation, Emma. Uh, I'm very interested in the, there's this trade-off, as you mentioned, that kind of maybe one of the key points of the paper between uh, less coherence is worse phase, but better depth. Mm -hmm. And um, in your simulations, it, you have a kind of like a smooth trade-off. Um, what I'm interested in is uh, how, in practice, how would a person know what setting they are for their coherence to help in this design point? Like what's like are some methods to figure that out? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, so we sort of go through two different kinds of simulations. The first is, you know, we just essentially extend the angular extent of the light source. Um, and typically in a setting like that, you know, you'd probably just be able to measure that um, sort of a priori. Uh, I don't, we didn't go into the question of um, reverse engineering that, but we also considered a, a second application in the paper where we have spatial variation across the image of uh, the coherence. So, um, an example of an application where that would arise is um, if you're doing fluorescence microscopy where you're uh, shining relatively coherent light through some sort of phase object and then within that object there's some sort of, you know, dense fluorophore uh, clustering. And so in the image patches where you're looking at the fluorophores, you have high, uh, sorry, you have low spatial coherence. And then uh, in the background where you have these phase objects, you have, um, you have the high spatial coherence. And so uh, you'll get phase sort of in the cell patches and depth in the um, fluorophore patches uh, if you can successfully separate them out and know sort of which version of this differential defocus constraint to apply. Uh, so in practice, um, we know from depth from differential defocus uh, that it's pretty easy to develop a confidence metric where basically if you have, um, you know, high uh, image gradient content, you're going to expect to get a good depth measurement out. And we find that that uh, that works pretty well as a, um, a way to throw out the parts of the image that are primarily phase content. Um, we've sort of left as future work uh, the sort of complementary uh, confidence metric for 
uh, how to figure out if you're in a, um, uh, a high spatial frequency uh, region of the image. Uh, but I think uh, given how easy a time we had developing the confidence metrics in the photography setting, uh, we believe that this is sort of a, an easy future next step um, to do the, the image patch separation. And um, uh, just to clarify these confidence metrics, uh, if you have it slightly off, is this all done in post-processing or would you have to know this beforehand of the imaging experiment? This is all from image content itself. Okay, so you can fine tune it as needed. Exactly. Okay, um, and I don't see any other questions on the, oh, there is one more question just came in from Ori Katz. Uh, it says, thanks for the uh, very interesting talk. Can you comment on the wavelength role in the two sides of the analogy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ori. Um, so yeah, we really considered um, spatial coherence as sort of our, our primary model, and we haven't really gotten into uh, the sort of spectral bandwidth of the light source, um, which obviously does have an effect, um, right? There's a, there's a wavelength term right in uh, TIE. We don't model it explicitly in the photography case. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, sort of in general, I think it's going to sort of, you know, blur out your signal a little bit and and reduce your performance if you're uh, if you have some kind of spread in those wavelengths. But um, we haven't uh, explicitly modeled um, any of those effects yet. Great, thank you. Fortunately, we're running a little bit on time, so for those further questions, Emma will be able to answer that on the live chat afterwards. But we're going to proceed again. Thank you, Emma. We're going to proceed again to our next talk. The title is Projected Distribution Loss for Image Enhancement. The authors are Mauricio Del Braccio, Hussein Talebi, and Payman Millenfar. Let's watch the video. We present the projected distribution loss for image enhancement. The goal of image enhancement is to correct image distortions such as noise, compression artifacts, limited resolution, or image blur. We introduce PDL, a projected distribution loss for training deep image restoration models by directly comparing feature distributions. Comparing feature distributions allow us to recover images with more realistic details while still having low pixel distortions compared to other approaches. Deep models can be trained to restore images by using thousands of low resolution, high resolution per examples. Training is done by finding the deep model parameters that minimize some loss function. The loss function penalizes the mismatch between the network prediction and the high resolution reference target. We can, for example, directly measure the discrepancy in the image pixel domain by computing the square pixel reconstruction error. Inverse problems, such as image restoration, do not generally have a unique solution. There's typically an infinite number of high quality images that can lead to the same low quality observation. This implies that when minimizing the loss function, the network learns to predict the average of all possible solutions. The predicted image won't necessarily look natural and typically be blurry due to the averaging of many possible candidates. Here, you can see an example for a super resolution network trained with an L2 pixel loss. The predicted image lacks of details and looks blurry. Many recent works have studied how to define losses that better characterize perceptual differences. The perceptual loss, also known as content loss, proposed to compare the target and generated images on a deep feature space. The deep features are extracted from intermediate representations from a deep model, such as a BGG network, pre-trained for image classification. The perceptual loss leads to superior results in terms of perceptual quality, but still suffers from the regression to the mean on the deep feature space. 
An alternative approach is to use an adversarial loss where the generated images are forced to be in the manifold given by the high-resolution training data. This is done by simultaneously training two networks, a generator or restoration network and a discriminator or a critic that learns to distinguish between real or fake images. The adversarial loss produces high-quality realistic results, but it's hard to control the hallucinated content since it's not a preference-based distance, but a distance to the full manifold. Additionally, training might be unstable due to required minimax alternative optimization. Our solution is to adopt a loss function that penalizes the distance between deep features distributions from the network predicted image and the reference one. The distribution of deep features encodes relevant high frequency information, such as image sharpness or texture grain, while being invariant to small shifts, noise, and other small changes presenting images. The distribution loss serves as a complement to a regular pixel loss. To compare the feature distributions, we relied on optimal transport theory, in particular to the buzzer sign distance that measures the amount of work needed to transform or to move one distribution into the other. The buzzer sign distance between multidimensional distributions doesn't have a closed form and generally an iterative numerical scheme is needed. For the particular one-dimensional case, the buzzer sign distance can be easily computed as a mean absolute difference between the two cumulative distributions. Since in practice we don't have access to the cumulative distributions, we rely on the empirical distributions. In this case, it can be shown that computing the buzzer sign distance amounts to sort the one-dimensional features and then computing the mean absolute difference. To exploit the good properties of the one-dimensional case, we adopt the slice buzzer sign distance introduced by Raban and colleagues. The overall idea is to project the data into one-dimensional subspaces and then compare and average the one-dimensional distributions. Here you can see an empirical distribution of a deep feature extracted from a VGG network for the reference image, the noisy low-quality input, the image recovered using the perceptual loss, and the image recovered PDL, our distribution loss. The empirical distributions of PDL is the closest to the reference one. We train deep image restoration models by minimizing a combination of a pixel loss and our distribution loss. The distribution loss is an average of the 1D faster than distances between the independent distribution of deep features extracted from a pre-trained VGG network. Please check our paper for more details. Next, we present some results. We evaluated the PDL loss in different image restoration tasks, such as denoising, motion deblurring, single image super resolution, and compression artifacts removal. Here, we show a comparison on image denoising of models trained with different losses. Our projected distribution loss leads to generated images that have more details than when directly minimizing the pixel loss 
or other approaches like the perceptual loss and the contextual loss. Here you can see a close-up of the lion hair. PDL preserves the hair texture much better than the other approaches. To analyze the performance of the PDL loss, we trained and compared many different models using different balances between the pixel and distribution loss terms. We found that the PDL loss produces a better range of good quality results when changing the loss balance parameters than the traditional perceptual loss. Here you can see a close-up of the best found configuration for PDL and the perceptual loss. PDL better preserves details than the perceptual loss. We evaluated the proposed loss by comparing classical reference metrics such as PSNR and the Structural Similarity Index measure, and also more recent perceptual quality metrics such as LPIPS and the non-reference-based ones NIQE and the Frechette Inception Distance between the generated and referenced image sets. As expected, directly minimizing the pixel error produces the best PSNR while poorly performing on the perceptual metrics. PDL produces the best results according to the perceptual quality metrics while having a competitive PSNR. We validated our findings by running a user study where human subjects are asked to choose between one of two images in terms of perceived image quality. Overall, PDL outperforms the other compared models showing the largest difference with respect to the non-perceptual pixel loss and the closest difference with respect to the contextual loss. Here we present some results when training models for single image super solution. The results are superior to the ones with other reference based losses and competitive to adversarial loss while producing a lower distortion on the pixel space. Here, we show a close-up of the best-performing models. Thanks for listening. For more information about the projected distribution loss and additional results, please check our paper. Okay, thanks everyone. And we're going to start the Q&A session for this talk. We have uh, author Mauricio Del Bracho here to answer your questions. Please write your questions in the live chat, but I'll kick it off. Um, one of the uh, uh, things I noticed in this uh, work is the focus on VGG features. Um, maybe could you talk a little bit about uh, why particularly VGG and if there are other features uh, if this approach would also work for other types of learned features um, used? Hi, Soren. Yes, this is a, a very interesting question. And we are actually currently working on, on this particular problem. We took BGG features from a, from a network train for classification because this is mostly what people have been doing so far. But there is like a lot of work to do here, in particular on how do we train the models and how we use the features uh, uh, from the models that we train, right? Image classification will provide better, good features. That is a very important question. And we, we, we didn't uh, tackle this particular question in the paper, but this is something that we're going to work in the future and we're currently working. In particular, we also explore using different features like inception, like features from an inception-based model, also train for image classification. But there is also the question on how you train this model where you are going to extract the features. Maybe there's 
space for doing more crazy stuff like self-supervised training and, and, and extract features in a different way. So yeah, this is a very important issue. Right, and just to kind of follow up on that, like, you know, if the, if uh, I guess a lot of people use VGG filters because it's trained on, uh, you know, all of ImageNet and it generally has been shown to be pretty transferable across it. Does your match, this kind of like slice Wasserstein distances that you're using, is that also a way to help determine what's a good feature? Is there kind of a, a way you can use, or do you think like you would just have to try out the new feature and see how the metric performs? Yeah, I think it's it's more about the, the visual quality that you get in the end. And for that, I we don't have like a, a great way of measuring that. I mean, people use deep features to, to measure quality. And it means like we are, we are in a cycle here, right? There is a, a closed loop. So I think that visual quality in, in the end is what you need to, to use for comparing different features. There There's some like recent work trying to do more analysis on the features, for instance, trying to see which particular features are sensitive to image sharpness or to, to texture content to brain. And that is also another way of, of tackling this problem. Um, and very quickly, uh, I'm really interested in, you know, a lot of people are starting to look at temporal like uh, videos and like, you know, there's this work on video consistency. I'm curious if, uh, if that's something you looked at is like per frame, do you imagine these kind of, uh, this metric to hold per frame, or is, or is there anything you can exploit in the correlation between frames? Yeah, th this is a, a very interesting uh, comment. We haven't, we haven't actually like considered video, but there is something that it should be. Uh, I think if someone wants to, to 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 extend this to video, we need to to consider also like the temporal consistency, and probably if it would be nice to to compute features across frames or features that also consider the temporal direction and maybe consider distributions of that instead of like doing independent frame features. Great, thank you. Well, for the sake of time, if anyone has any more questions, they can put it in the chat and Mauricio will be happy to answer it, but we're gonna continue on to our last talk of this session. Uh, the title is Ultrasound Phase Imaging Using the Memory Effect. The authors are Timothy Weber, Nikunj Ketan, Ruhi Yang and Jerome Mertz. Let's watch the video. So uh, good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you about a uh, technique we've been working on to do uh, ultrasound phase imaging. So uh, a little word about phase imaging. Uh, so the idea is you can do it with pretty much any, any types of wave. Uh, you, you send in waves into a sample, and the idea is to measure the phase shifts imparted on those waves by, by objects inside the sample. And there are many tricks to do this uh, with light, um, some of which are listed here, uh, but the point is they're all based on a transmission geometry. And so why is that? Uh, well, it turns out you see very different things, uh, whether you use transmission or reflection uh, geometries. For example, if you use reflection mode, then you're looking at reflected waves and the only structures inside your sample that uh, produce high enough momentum changes to cause the waves to do a U-turn are, are um, structures with very high axial spatial frequencies, uh, such as sharp interfaces or uh, point-like structures. And a good example of a reflection mode uh, imaging uh, is optical coherence tomography. Now in contrast, in transmission mode, you're, you're, you're transmitting waves through a sample, and you can get signal basically from very weak tilts of that wave off axis. And so first of all, you're looking now at transverse spatial frequencies, but those uh, transverse spatial frequencies can be very weak and you'll still see signal. And a good example is uh, a differential interference contrast. Um, and so, as I said, both of these reveal very different structures inside your sample. Here's an example where we compare OCT imaging and DIC imaging in the same sample. This is uh, mouse skin. And you can see that, for example, uh, fat droplets inside the mouse skin, you can't see them with OCT. They just appear as dark voids. But with DIC, you can, you can see them very well. Uh, so I'll talk a lot about uh, uh, differential interference contrast in this talk. Um, and uh, a remarkable thing about DIC is that you can use completely incoherent uh, uh, illumination. Um, to, uh, it works uh, with incoherent light. 
And so uh, you might think that's a problem because uh, incoherent light is random phases. If you send random phases in, then no matter what the object does to those phases, there'll be random coming out and you won't be able to create a phase image out of this. But uh, DIC uses a trick and that trick is a lateral shear interferometry. And the idea is you take that incoherent illumination and you basically copy it with a beam splitter and, and shear those two copies relative to one another. And you send the two copies through the phase object and then you recombine them. And then instead of looking at the phases in each copy, you look at the phase differences between each copy. And by looking at those phase differences, uh, what you'll reveal is the edges of the phase object very nicely. Uh, as you can see here, these are, these are just slides on a microscope slide. If you look at them when, with incoherent bright field illumination, a standard bright field microscope, you hardly see anything. Uh, but if you look at them with this trick uh, of lateral shear interferometry, suddenly you can see the edges very well in, this, in these cells. And so I talked about OCT and DIC and explained why you see very different structures from these modalities, because one is uh, based on reflection, the other one is based on transmission. These are uh, optical modalities. And, and the question is, uh, uh, do they have analogs uh, uh, in, in sound, in acoustics? And uh, as we all know, uh, ultrasound imaging is basically the acoustic analog of, of OCT. They, they work on the same principle and gives you very similar type imaging. Now the question is, is there the uh, uh, acoustic analog of DIC imaging? And that's what I'll talk about uh, today. And so a word about uh, ultrasound imaging, standard ultrasound imaging or B-mode imaging. The way it's usually done is you have a, a linear transducer array and you use, uh, for example, a subset of elements in this transducer array and you sweep them very quickly uh, uh, through uh, your sample, uh, sending in narrow uh, beams of sound, which you sweep. Now I would say this is the, the old way of doing uh, B-mode imaging. Uh, uh, the newer, I think better way of doing B-mode imaging is to send plane waves into your sample and sweep the tilt angles of those plane waves. And this, is, this technique is called coherent plane wave compounding. Uh, and it was developed by uh, the Fink group uh, over a decade ago. And the advantage of this is that in the old way, you're basically stuck with a sort of a, a weak focus wherever it is. With this new way, you can synthesize post hoc uh, high NA foci, uh, illumination foci, uh, anywhere you want in the sample, post hoc. And uh, so it's very fast. So uh, again, uh, let's say you want to look at a particular point in your sample, you would uh, uh, insonify it with a plane wave, and you would hit that point with your plane wave, and then you would look at the, the, the scatter, the scattered sound, the, the echo from that point uh, uh, with your entire receive point spread function from all your actuators. And you would do this for multiple plane waves with multiple tilt angles. But again, this is a reflection mode uh, uh, technique. Uh, is there a way to take this same device and to do transmission mode imaging with it? For example, let's say we wanna look at that same point with the same transmit plane wave and the same receive point spread function can we look at it in a transmission mode? And the answer is yes, all you have to do is wait. If you wait, then you're not uh, uh, insonifying your point directly with the plane wave, but you're insonifying it indirectly with ra randoms backscatter from deeper layers within your sample. And uh, the amount of time you wait is, is shown here in, in green. Uh, but the problem with this is that uh, now you're insonifying that point, not with a nice plane wave, with completely random uh, sound, random speckle. And so you might think this is a problem to, to generate a phase image from this, but no, it isn't because we're gonna use the trick uh, that we learned from optical DIC. And so to understand how we do that, you have to understand this effect called the memory effect, which is, which is also uh, quite remarkable. And here what I'm showing you is the received sound that you get back, the echoes that you get back when you send uh, a series of plane waves with various tilt angles into your sample. And you would expect that uh, since your sample is completely random, that the, 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 this received random backscatter is completely random. And it is, it looks like speckle, it's completely random. But what you find is that that randomness is sort of preserved from one tilt angle to another. And it's preserved in a very interesting way. Uh, you see that the speckle kind of shifts in both space and time, depending on the angle 
of the, the, the incident uh, transmit pulse. And this shift uh, is, is called the memory effect. And so it's very remarkable, it's remarkable. It's well understood and, and each one of these speckled grains sort of follows a trajectory that, that obeys a very simple uh, sort of uh, mirror reflection law, which uh, is described by these two equations. So you get shifts in both uh, space and time. And so we're gonna use this uh, to do phase imaging. Uh, we're gonna insonify our point of interest, not with one uh, incoherent uh, speckle pattern, but rather with two speckle patterns obtained from two uh, uh, plane waves, uh, different uh, tilt angles. Uh, but those two patterns, because of the memory effect, are basically the same patterns, but sheared relative to one another. And so basically this is the same configuration as DIC. And if we have a phase object, which say has an edge in between these two rec received point spread functions, we would see the, 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 uh, the edges of that phase object uh, very nicely. And so we call this technique uh, uh, ultrasound differential phase contrast imaging. Uh, here's the basic procedure. Instead of just using two uh, transmit pulses uh, with two angles, we're gonna use a, a, a sequence of multiple angles, exactly the same as you would do in, in B-mode imaging. In fact, we're gonna use the same raw data, but to convert our imaging from a reflection mode to a transmission mode, we're gonna apply an arbitrary time delay to all our received data. And then we're gonna calculate the phase differences between image pairs from pairs of tilt angles. And since we have multiple pairs to work with, we can, we can do averaging. And so does it work? Well, here's uh, an image uh, of a phantom. Uh, uh, this is random scatterers inside the phantom. And inside this phantom, there's an inclusion, uh, but that inclusion has been designed to produce only phase shifts and not to produce a scattering contrast shifts. And so you can't really see it with standard B mode. Here we're using standard B mode with a sequence of 13 angles. Uh, and, and really you can't see that, that inclusion inside the, the phantom. But now if we use, if we do DPC imaging with all, even just with two of those angles, we start seeing that there's something there. And if we use the 12 pairs of angles that we have with our 13 angles, and you average the DPC images from each one of those pairs, you can start revealing that structure very nicely. And we can do further averaging uh, because remember we're applying these phase, these time delays to our received data. We can apply whatever time delays we want. And so you can average over the time delays uh, to further increase, increase uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, this, uh, uh, you can start thinking about being quantitative with this. So here's an example of uh, uh, inclusions with different speed that, that have different speeds of sound relative to the background. Uh, the two on the left are lower speeds of sound in the background. The two on the right are higher speeds of sound in the background. And you can see that there's an inversion in phase contrast, uh, as you would expect. And interestingly, if you, you integrate in the transverse direction, meaning that you're converting phase derivatives into actual phase, and you sort of plot the phase of these, of these objects, you can see that the phase shifts, that the phases uh, imparted by these objects uh, are, are basically the, what you would expect from the, the known speeds of sound of, of these inclusions. So we can think about being quantitative. Uh, finally, I'd like to show that uh, with just a very, very standard computer, no GPU or anything, we can do simultaneous B-mode and DPC imaging. Here we're looking at uh, an interesting uh, phantom which has step cylinder inclusions and we're taking our ultrasound probe and gliding over the different diameters of these inclusions. And you can see these inclusions are changing size as we glide over the different cylinders. Uh, there were actually two, one on top of the other uh, in this image. Uh, and, and now we slide away, uh, we slide that inclusion away. So uh, I'm running out of time. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the students who worked on this project, Tim Weber, Nikunj Katan, and Ron Yang. And I wanna thank the funding agencies and I wanna thank you for listening. Okay, welcome back everyone for the final Q&A session for this session of the ICSP conference. I have author Jerome Mertz with us to answer your questions. Reminder that you can write your questions via the live chat on the YouTube uh, to the right of the video and I'll answer that. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with the first question from Akshat Dave here. How does the angular range for the memory effect to hold in ultrasound compared to that invisible light? 
Uh, well, <clears throat> that's one very nice thing about ultrasound is that it's uh, you have temporal resolution. So uh, you have time gating basically. So, uh, which is different in optics. If you just have a camera, you really don't have time gating. You're basically integrating over time. And so it turns out when you time gate, uh, you have a very large range. The memory effect extends over a very large range. And so um, uh, actually we're studying that right now. What is the range of the uh, memory effect depending on the uh, time resolution? And it does change. Uh, so that's one really nice thing about uh, ultrasound. It's, it's, it's very easy to, to uh, look at that parameter of time resolution. Um, and actually, this is kind of a follow-up question from Ori that's kind of related is, uh, he says, thanks for the beautiful talk. Could you comment on the dependence of the memory effect on the chosen delay time itself? On the chosen delay time. We didn't look at that in detail. I don't think it uh, depends very much on the chosen uh, delay time. It really depends on the temporal resolution that we choose. So the chosen delay time is solely to get that lateral shift effect that? The, the, yeah, it's, it's to convert your, your imaging system from a reflection system to a transmission system. And it is, would there be any limitations or that, or that's kind of an open design parameter? Well, it's true. I mean, you want to, you want to delay uh, long enough that what's coming back has a large enough shift that you can see it on two separate actuators. Okay. Um, Ashok Viragavan says, thanks for a great talk. What are the actual practical bioimaging applications for this? What features get more visible with this mode of imaging compared to B-mode ultrasound? Well, we're hoping uh, that this will be useful in soft tissue imaging, for example, looking at tumors or, 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 or such. Uh, for example, it's known that tumors have a different speed of sound than the surrounding tissue. So we're hoping we actually have contrast on, on different speeds of sound structures in soft tissue, which you wouldn't be able to see with uh, regular B mode contrast. So we haven't done that yet. We're trying to get our OB approval right now uh, before we start doing human imaging with this technique. And uh, because of the way the system is set up, it can do both B mode and That's right. B mode. So it could be potentially, it's complementary. That's right, it's complete, it's for free. It's information for free, basically. Great. Well, um, we're, we're, a little, we're over time here. So if you have any more questions, you could put it in the YouTube chat, but I wanna thank Jerome Mertz for answering the questions and for the great presentation and work. Um, with that, we're going to end the session. We have a break now for about 15 minutes or actually 18 minutes. And then we're, um, actually, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the next uh, talk will begin at 1.30 Pacific time, 4.30 Eastern time with the final session, including the best paper award during that session. So definitely want to tune in for that. Uh, with that, I'd like to again, thank all of the authors uh, and presenters today. And thanks to the audience for their insightful questions. See you very soon.